we're going to jump into talking about an article that you wrote. So you have a series of articles actually mm -hmm. called Better Sex for Women. Um, I want to start by just talking about that. You know, why, why did you write Better Sex for Women? You know, who's it written to? What inspired it? Yeah, yeah, good question. So uh, as a certified sex therapist, I have a lot of couples dealing with sexual difficulties in the relationship and have just uh, witnessed over the years how uh, the mindset, attitudes, communications around sex, both in our culture, but also within the church, have really not been reflective of God's heart about sex. And it has uh, really impacted uh, men and women, but especially women in their sense of uh, sexuality. And God has, the enemy has used that to create uh, a division and disconnect between husband and wife. It's created shame around sexuality for uh, many of the couples that I work with. And there's just a real struggle there and intention uh, both internally and relationally around the subject. And so I just really felt the desire to speak to some of the common areas that I have witnessed, seen uh, in the couples that I have worked with over the years to be able to address those things uh, and really hopefully shed a light from God's perspective and speak truth into uh, those broken places in a way that can bring healing and wholeness, uh, unity between couples, and just really allow that cool part of uh, life that God wired into us to be embraced, enjoyed, and shared uh, with their spouse for the gals out there. So that was really the, the driving motivator uh, for this series. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again, but like, I feel like it is so unique to see um, articles like this and series like this in a Christian environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, sex is God's idea. He thought of it, right? The fact that we are sexual creatures, that we have sexual desire, that we engage and pursue connecting sexually, uh, all of that he thought of and he wired into our bodies and into the fabric of our society. And so uh, it makes sense that God's people would be the ones talking about sex, but the enemy's been really effective at silencing the church and having us really abdicate our role in communicating God's truth around sex in a way that's been really harmful to us. Yeah, you know, there's just this culture of shame, I feel like, mm -hmm. within the church around sexuality and sex. Um, and like you said, if anyone should be talking about it, it should be God's people. And so yeah. I love that you are so passionate about this and um, that you have this whole series on Better Sex for Women, which I think is super, super important. So if you are a woman watching this, after we finish, go check out um, all of those articles on the website that are just so, so helpful from just a biblical Christian perspective, better sex for women, so important. And with that, we're going to jump into one of the articles within that series. So this article was called Busyness, Sex Killer. Yes. All right. Yes, can attest that being busy and being overwhelmed and always moving is a sex killer. So let's talk about it. Okay, so my question would be, why do we get too busy for sex? Like, why does that even happen? Totally, yeah. It's just, uh, you know, I think there's a strategic component on the enemy's part. You know, the enemy's been around for a long time and targeting and tearing down marriages and families, uh, you know, since Adam and Eve in the garden, right? And so uh, there's a, a, a lot of well-practiced tools in the enemy's tool set in uh, creating dissension, disunity, disconnect for couples. And uh, in our present day and age, just the pace at which society moves and all of the different opportunities that are available to us that in and of themselves are good things, but we have so many good things that there's no space for Sabbath, there's no space for connecting, there's no space for the healthy rhythms of life that enable us to be ourself at best. And one of the consequences of that is time-starved relationships that are uh, lacking the uh, amount of face time and, and quality time engagement that leads to emotional connection and intimacy. 
Uh, and so there's uh, not that closeness and connection that's a part of healthy sexuality. And then there's also just literally difficulty having space to connect at any time other than when we're completely fatigued and exhausted in a way that does not set up uh, sexual experiences to be at their best and creates just a real breakdown. Yeah, absolutely. And you see a lot of couples, um, a lot of couples, you know, in counseling. And so how common would you say that this is in marriage? I mean, is this common? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, probably somewhere around uh, one in one couples probably struggle with this, Mm -hmm. right? That is a hundred percent that at one level or another, I can't think of a single couple that I've ever worked with uh, that there wasn't the reality of how busyness impedes on uh, the quality of their connection with each other. Yeah. Like oftentimes it's layered with other things that are in the mix also, and that may not be the only thing, but it's one of the factors that really are um, exacerbating and making more difficult the other challenges that they're facing. Yeah, I feel like I know what you're going to say to this, but can it be fixed? Is this a fixable issue? I, I, I'm going to say no, hmm. which is probably not what you were expecting. That wasn't what I was expecting. I was expecting you to be like, yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's more something that has to be managed, right? Hmm. That there's not a fix in the sense that we're going to do this or we're going to implement that and we're never going to struggle with this again. Like that's like would be nice and be, you know, really great. But in reality, that's just not reality that we're not likely to completely uh, uh, take apart the way society operates in such a way that uh, jobs aren't demanding, parenting isn't demanding, that we're not uh, overwhelmed with different things, vying and asking for our time and attention. Like, we're going to continually be bombarded by things that are begging for our attention and focus and for us to spend time in. And so there's some strategies that we can talk about in terms of how to manage that reality, but it's not going to fix it. Instead, it's going to be something we have to uh, continually keep top of mind if we're going to stay in a healthy place. And we're probably going to find ourselves in seasons where we're doing really great with it and we're feeling good about the connection and then seasons where we're maybe out of balance in some ways and start to feel the effects of that and have to go, oh yeah, I need to get back to these things that I know. Right. So speaking of, you know, managing um, instead of fixing, right? So you Mm -hmm. mentioned um, at the beginning of the article, time wasters. Um, So first question would just be, what maybe are some examples of time wasters? And the second question would be, how do we set practically boundaries with those things that waste our time? Yeah, let me, let me start with saying that, you know, it's, it's normal to struggle with this, right? We set up one in one couple struggle with this and it's normal for you to uh, return to struggling with it, right? That it's not like, uh, there's no sense in, in beating yourself up if you find yourself in this time-starved relationship place, this uh, kind of sex-starved dynamic because life's been crazy and we just haven't been able to connect. Like the enemy likes to shame us. He's the accuser of the saints. He likes stuff, kind of put us in this hole and it's not helpful. You can just go, this is a normal struggle that normal healthy couples who have a great relationship struggle with. And it's just something that we need to be reminded of as something to give attention to so that we can be intentional about caring for this aspect of our relationship and life together. So that's, that's the first thing I want to say. The last thing anybody watching this needs is, you know, someone whapping you over the head and shaming you because uh, your life is busy and crazy, just like the rest of ours. This is something Josh has to work on as much as the next person. That my life gets out of balance and crazy. And Cassie and I find ourselves disconnected from all the different things vying for our attention regularly and have to come back to a focused effort 
and making space for us. So that's the first thing I would want folks to hear. Right. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. So, you know, practically what boundaries could be set in maybe avoiding that happening or just managing it when it starts to happen and and how do we recognize it? And, you know, how do we set those boundaries? Yeah. So first thing we got to be, we got to be open with each other, right? That it's uh, uh, normally the way this goes is one spouse or the other will uh, kind of come to the awareness before the other that, hey, things don't feel good, right? Like, I'm missing you. Uh, I feel disconnected. I feel like I've had this exact conversation with my husband before. Exactly. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Right. And, and, and the same for him to me, you know, sometimes I don't pick up on it. I'm just go, go, go. And he's like, you know, I feel so disconnected from you. Yeah. He's like, Hey, remember me? We used to date, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there's that, that longing for connection. Yeah. And, and we turn to our other and we make a bid for connection, right? We're like, Hey, I'm missing you. And uh, two thoughts on that are one, uh, it, how we approach the bid, right? Because we can approach the bid in what we call a protest stance and that and we're mad that we're disconnected, right? And we're like, you haven't been making time for me, ah, rah, 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 right? Which- Very like, it's your fault, not mine. Exactly, exactly. Which Lisa's defensiveness, right? Because when somebody comes at us like this, the natural kind of response to that is kind of to pull back defensively like that. Not helpful. So it's so much better to be able to go uh, sharing what we've been feeling in the sense of, I miss you. I'm feeling disconnected. And I feel the, you know, like I, I need more time with you and around you and engagement with you. And, that, and the other side of that is to be receptive. Instead of going, well, you, you, this, you, that, you know, you're on Facebook, you're blah, da, 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 all the different things that we can kind of respond defensively to go to hear that through the lens of love. Oh, you like me. Oh, you miss me. That you want connection in that. And there's a sadness there about the disconnect. Okay so that we can turn towards each other and look at the problem, you know, the disconnect, whatever that is, as a team, right? Link arms and go, yeah, I wanna feel connected with you too. And I like you too and enjoy being with you. And yeah, as I step back and pause for a moment, I can feel the distance there too. Let's, let's make a plan. You know, why, what can we do to get out of the space? And, and that sets the tone, that gets us doing teamwork. And then we can start looking at some of the things that maybe have gotten us there. But there's some common things. I mean, I mean, I bet, I bet you and everybody out there having not read the article can probably identify like at least a handful of things that are on that list, right? Like what's the top one off in your mind? What comes to mind when think about the, the time sucks for your relationship? Oh man, you know, I think, and this is maybe weird, but I think of cleaning. I think that, you know, sometimes I get so sucked in, like I have to clean the whole house and then I'm just stressed out trying to clean. And, yes. and we have our whole night to hang out mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. and I spend it cleaning instead of spending Ooh. time with him. Yeah, I think that's such an awesome example because it's an example of something that's not inherently bad which is initially the things that maybe we're inclined to think about, you know, of, you know, big, uh, you know, maybe uh, going um, Netflix or getting lost in Netflix or YouTube and, you know, spending hours watching the, watching TV, right? right. That's kind of the obvious target it's that's out there. Side by side on our phones for an hour and a half. Right, right. Exactly. Where we're sucked in a device and we're there, but we're not there with each other like we're each in our own little worlds, even though we're sitting on the same couch, right? Those are things that people kind of readily identify and like, yeah, that's probably not good in that. But there's the things that we uh, you know, don't readily think of that are things that, that are good, but they're not necessarily the best thing, 
right? And there's this Mary and Martha kind of dynamic that we see happen, right? Where what Martha was up to was not bad, like she's serving, right? She's serving the king. She's serving Jesus and the disciples that are there. She's preparing the meal. She's doing these different things that are hospitality, that are service to the king. Like they're, they're good and valuable things, but they weren't the best thing him in that space, right? That, that Mary had the idea of the presence and being in the King's presence and sitting at his feet and engaging and that connecting with him was the opportunity that Martha was missing in that. And that's exactly what can happen to all of us, right? You know, we're engaging in things that are necessary and that are important and that are valuable and they're good. And yet maybe at the expense of the best thing, you know, that connection with our spouse, that the, the cleaning will probably wait and it will probably won't have to condemn the house, you know, or, or burn it down to the ground and start over from scratch. It'll probably tie it over the opportunity to connect while we have it, you know, or to respond to a bid for that attention and that connection from our spouse. Those are precious moments that we want to not trade out, you know, not uh, miss the best uh, because of the good. Yeah. And it's something so key, you know, in all of that is quality time, right? So mm-hmm. that is so key in connecting with our spouse, um, right. not just time, not just sitting together side by side on the couch on their phone, yes. quality time. Yes. Um, and I wondered if you could kind of expand on the tomato plant analogy that you give in your article. Yes, absolutely. So uh, I don't know where this idea came from. Sometimes I have these analogies and word pictures that I just think, you know, uh, I won't blame it on the Holy Spirit, but it's me in the course of a session going, how can I communicate this idea in a way that makes sense or connect, right? And I'll be like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like a tomato plant. (laughs) I feel like plant analogies just always work. They always work. I've never once had this is an why veggie tales where a plant so successful, analogy right? didn't tell me clearly what I was trying to figure out. <laughs> right. That's why veggie tales wins at the end of the day, right? The plant analogies get the job done. It's true. So uh, the tomato plant analogy, I spent a lot of time in Missouri and in the Midwest and growing gardens in the summertime. And uh, you know, tomato plants need a ton of water in order to survive, right? In order to flower, uh, be fruitful, you know, and grow and, and delicious plum tomatoes to enjoy. We eat them like apples, like plucking them in a salt shaker out in a, in an ice cream bucket in the garden and just kind of eat them right off the vine. But you, uh, you have to, to water them in order to. Everything else can be perfect condition-wise. Right? You can have a great starter plant, you can have great sun exposure, soil, fertilizer, everything can be perfect. You can build a fence around it to keep you know, critters from chewing on them. But if you don't water it, it's not going to grow. It's not going to thrive. And it's not like you can dump 100 gallons of water on it in the beginning of the season and then not water it the rest of the year. Right? Uh, well, we'll, just, we'll just put a whole bunch of on it right now. Won't need to water it in that. It won't work, you know, and it's not like there's something called uh, super wet water, right, that we can somehow like uh, just use this much water, but because it's, it's super duper quality, super wet water, and that, that we, we only need this much of it in there. The plant requires regular steady watering in order to grow, because the ground can only soak up so much at a time. Everything else feeds up and rolls off. And the plant is going to need watering again a couple of days later, right? So the, the imagery reflects in the relationship and the reality that this, the maybe myth or misconception that, uh, you know, we take vacations a few times a year and we have all this time together where it's undivided attention and we can dump a hundred gallons on it at once that kind of tie us through to the next vacation or trip or thing that we can do, even though we don't see each other, you know, we're just like two ships passing them a night in between those times. It doesn't work. I mean, vacations are great, fabulous, 
and that, uh, but the ground can only soak up so much at once. And a couple of days later, it's gonna need watered again. Or there's this myth of, <clears throat> you know, we don't have very much time together, but we just make it really good in the time that we do have, right? Like it's super high quality. And so even though we only have this much time together, it's, you know, it's just, it's about quality, not quantity in that, right? Which is a myth also. That's not to say that quality doesn't matter. It's to say that no amount of quantity or no amount of quality is going to make a tomato plant not need to be watered again in a couple of days. It just doesn't work like that. Our relationships, like a tomato plant, need that regular watering in order to be healthy and thrive and be fruitful. And it doesn't take very long without regular watering. And the leaves start to shrivel, the flowers fall off, the thing you know just shrivels up and dies. And relationally, we can get to that place where we're just we're going through the motions, but it, the connection between us has shriveled up and died. Yeah, no, that's such a good analogy. And, you know, you, you talk about this quality time and how important it is. And one of the things that you touch on in the article is being able to maybe even like schedule it, right? Like mm -hmm. scheduling out, like, when are we going to have quality time? When are we going to do this? When are we going to have sex? My question mm -hmm going into, you know, scheduling time to have sex, does that take away from being present, from being spontaneous? I mean, does it make it less special? Are we just doing it as a duty? Yes. That's the, that is the automatic hundred percent of the time question. Yeah. Have, right. Like that sounds awfully mechanical, right? Like that take away the spontaneity. That just seems weird. Sometimes guys are even like, I don't even think it could work. Like, I, I don't know, does the mechanics even work like that? Like you could kind of plan it on demand or that sort of thing, what, what in the world? And the truth is that we plan for things that are important and things that are valuable, right? Like you don't just like uh, randomly brush your teeth kind of whenever you think to do that, right? Or whenever it's convenient. And I mean, I'm thinking you probably have a pretty regular schedule for brushing your teeth, right? Because, you know, your teeth falling out of your head is not what you want. And so you had regular scheduled intervals engage that. Eating, pretty important to nourish the body. We plan for it. Does that mean there's no spontaneity in our eating? Does that mean it's the same mundane meal every day? That mean that we can't look forward to dinner time because ah, I had dinner yesterday and that or just knowing that dinner is coming completely takes the joy of eating away. And then. <laughs> so true. Right. It's we plan for things that are important. And uh, I'm listen, if you are, uh, you know, your husband is like cooking for you right? In dinner one night and he's cooking your favorite dish, right? That thing that you love every time he makes it for you. And that he tells you, you know, as you uh, leave the house in the morning, Hey, I'm cooking tonight at home, fill in the blank there. And that, are you dreading that all day? Are, are you like, uh, like, ah, I wish he wouldn't have told me that this is taking the spontaneity away from it. I'm not going to enjoy it at all now. Oh no. When he walks in the door, I'll give him the skillet. Like go do it. Yeah. yeah your mouth is watering all day. You're thinking you, about I don't have that. to do anything. <laughs> right. Right. So you're anticipating it. And that anticipation kind of builds the excitement towards it. Right. I mean, as kids, do we, you know, dread or lose the joy of Christmas morning because we know it's coming? No, no, it doesn't remove the joy and the spontaneity and the excitement around it to know that's coming. In fact, it allows space for that anticipation to build in a way that really enriches the experience. And this is true of our sex life. So that because it's important, we make space for it in regular intervals within our day and within our, or within our week. And so that we're making space to connect. Not that it's rigid and we can't rearrange that and we can't, you know, any more than, you know, if we need to move dinner up or back. Right. Or, if the kids you know, have a sport event and things 
exactly. Move or, you know, they, your husband goes to the grocery store and they were out of a key ingredient that you needed. And so I'll have to make it for you later in the week when they get it in. You know, there's not a rigid thing, but instead it's, hey, because it matters and it's important, we're intentional about it and planning and making space. And we look forward to that time together, right? And this is especially key for women. And that, that one of the things that we uh, know from research and have found about uh, women and their sexuality, that when they think about a sexual experience and an upcoming sexual experience, your body actually begins to prepare for that experience in advance of it. That it increases your enjoyment of that experience because your body's already preparing for that experience before it arrives. And so the uh, knowing about the experience allows you to anticipate and to fantasize and to think about that experience in a way that kind of uh, makes, you know, to use the food analogy or mouthwater kind of anticipation of the experience together. And so that can be a really fun and playful, flirtatious thing throughout the day and texting back and forth or, you know, thinking about date night or, you know, uh, just that fun, playful banter between husband and wife around anticipating the sharing that joy together. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I love the idea of just thinking about it less as like a rigid schedule and more mm-hmm. as just intentionality for something that is important and should be important and is just vital to our connection as a husband and a wife. So last question before we kind of finish up, but to the people who are listening, the people who are watching, who are maybe struggling couples that feel very disconnected and are so busy, what's a word of advice that you as a counselor, as a sex therapist would give to them? Yeah. I don't think that I can pull that off in a word, but well, I'll, we'll strap a few words together here and see what we can, we can do. So the, the first thing that I would say is, uh, you know, and you can follow up on other articles in this series that speak around this subject, but husbands need to know that when we're talking about uh, not allowing busyness to encroach in, that we're talking about uh, more than just what happens in the bedroom, because a misconception of, of a husband will be like, hey, hey, I'm making time. Like, we're here to make time. Let's get naked. This will be great. And uh, the wife is going to be like, what about making time like having made it home for dinner and has actually been able to have some conversation and some meaningful dialogue and connection? Like if, if she doesn't feel that emotional connection and connectedness, then just because you make a window of time in the evening to get naked uh, doesn't mean that you've made time for the relationship in a way that allows connection and pays the way for that. So kind of break out of the paradigm of just thinking about making space for sex to thinking about what making space for connecting within our relationship looks like, which lays the foundation uh, for a healthy uh, sex life and sexual connection. So that would be the first thing that I would say, uh, don't don't, uh, kind of misunderstand what's being said here. And don't, I'm talking to you, husband out there right now don't even think about like weaponizing this talk and being like josh says we need to make time this is about us as a couple working together to make space in our relationship for connecting including connecting sexually so make sure it's a teamwork thing not a guilt shame demand pressure all that kind of nonsense that doesn't help things so there's, there's that piece that I would say. And then there's the, uh, yeah, let's just make, um, recognize the importance of it and have a conversation with one another that says, hey, you know what? I've been feeling the disconnect. You know, I've been, you know, uh, missing you. I've been missing connecting physically with you. I've been missing emotional connection with you. No judgment, I'm not blaming. Can we just have a conversation about how we can make space for that? And the scheduling piece. Here's the magic formula. Everybody loves formulas. I can't give you a lot of formulas in life, but here's a little kind of magic marriage time kind of formula for you. 
that is super practical and can be a starting place for thinking about connection, right? Daily, you need 15 or 20 minutes of each other's undivided attention. These would be minimums, right? These are all minimums. You know, we think about watering the tomato plant. Daily, you need 15, 20 minutes of space where you're not on your phone, you're not on other device, you're not multitasking, and that you just have each other's undivided attention to connect. And uh, for some couples, that's sitting on the uh, at the the kitchen nook, the breakfast nook in the morning, having a coffee together, and that's where they connect. Uh, for others, they come home from lunch and they share lunch together, and they're just they're eating, they're chatting, they have that connection. Maybe it's sharing a glass of wine on the swing uh, uh, on the porch in their house in the evening after dinner, and they've got kids doing dishes, doing other things, and it takes some space just to be there and give each other undivided attention. Others, it's pillow talk, and they, they get into bed before, you know, they're completely zonked. They turn off the TV and lay down the phones and just have some time to connect and visit about life. Minimum 15, 20 minutes a day, undivided attention, right? And then weekly, you need a date night. You need a few hours a week where you have a block of time where you can get away from work, get away from kids, get away from all the other stressors and responsibilities and just be lovers, you know, be friends, hang out, date like you did before you got married, right? Get, do, go do something that you enjoy together, have a shared experience uh, and have that in a, you know, a two to four hour block of time where you can just be lovers and friends, hang out, have that connection with each other. And then quarterly, Right, right. So once every three months or so, and that have an overnight where you actually have a whole day or maybe a whole weekend where you get away and are able to spend a whole day or two, you know, without all the distractions, but just enjoying time together. So that's just some, some practical direction on how to carve out the time to connect and to be able to then uh, play in regular times of connecting sexually at a frequency that feels good to both of you uh, in the context of caring for the relationship as a whole. Yeah, yeah, that's such great advice. I, I hope that the people watching are encouraged if this is something that you and your spouse have struggled with because I'm encouraged just listening to it and getting ideas as far as, you know, having a date night and um, what does that, you know, time, those, those 20 to 30 minutes look like for, for me and my husband right now in this season and things like that. I mean, I just, I'm getting us so many ideas. I like want to sit down with Chase and talk with him about it. So yes. thank you for just sharing your words of wisdom, of advice. Um, it's so good to talk with someone who is just specializes in sex therapy, Christian sex therapy with just this really awesome view of it um, as being very intentional and special um, and just a connectiveness. So thank you, Josh, for talking a little bit about that You're article. Welcome. And um, like I said before, you guys, if you are a female, if you are a husband, go and read this series, Better Sex for Women. So good. That's um, for, I'm just yes. saying, your wife, you say, no, I've been trying to think about how we can connect and have more fun together and make space and would love to have a conversation about that. No judgment, no blaming, no attack, just, you know, two people who like each other trying to figure out how to grow closer together. I think, I don't know, Chase wants to have that conversation with you. How do you feel about that, Tori? <laughs> I mean, yeah, like, I think that, that that should be an open conversation that we can right. have and, um, I think that these articles are a good way to get there, right? They're a good way to just kind of open that conversation. Like, hey, I was reading this article that Josh wrote and it really inspired me to, to ask you about this, you know? Mm -hmm. Totally. You can definitely name drop and use as leverage to kind of springboard. Josh, send me here. <laughs>